Okay, so what we're going to do in this session between now and lunchtime is we're actually going to compress sessions 10 and 11 into this one and a half hours. There's lots of details in there that you probably would care not to hear about. <laughs> you might want to see it, the slides will be there, but I'm not to, going to go in so much detail because we wanted to leave more time for the ODV presentation just after lunch and time for you to work on what your presentation will be. So we've decided to compress these two. And uh, there's, as I say, there's lots of details in the session uh, as prepared, but I'm going to be skipping over certain of the slides because they, uh, it's, it's information that you don't really uh, need to worry much about. So this first part, we'll be talking about what we call the unique t data tagging scheme within GTSPP. And the, the, the idea of having a unique data tag is essentially to help us identify duplications or data versions that come through different routes into the program. So a real-time profile, a delayed mode profile, a delayed mode profile that's had some changes to it so that it doesn't actually fall within the 15-minute, uh, five-kilometer kind of criterion. And, and so we can't identify it as duplicates through that method. And uh, the other, there's another complication in the real time that I didn't explain, but some vessels don't want to identify who they are. So instead of using the real call sign like they have, they just, the letters they use are S-H-I-P. So navies do that all the time. They're willing to put the data on the GTS, or at least some of it, but they don't want to say which ship they are, so they put SHIP. And so these are not, it's not possible to construct a, a ship track of those because they're all over the place. Um, and it's also, uh, it gets all mixed together. And so we wanted a way to identify, another way to identify duplicates. And in this case, and of course, the reason for getting rid of duplicates is because if you do statistical analyses, if you, you know, if you have 20 profiles and 15 of them are all really the same, you get strong biases into your statistics, which is not desirable. So that's, that's why we wanted to do it. We're also driven by, um, within, um, well, this is what I was just saying, that you, we can't necessarily identify within the classical way of of uh, position and, and uh, time differences. And again, because there are changes in the data values, calibrations take place, uh, corrections to the navigations that, that was recorded on board and so on, the, you, that's not necessarily reliable. So you can have exact duplicates. Um, the data come in twice exactly the same for whatever reason. Sometimes it's in the communication system. In fact, within the GTSPP program in Canada, we have asked uh, four, uh, three different countries to actually extract all of the real-time messages from the GTS and FTP that file to us in Canada. So Germany does this, Japan does this, US does it, and then we have our own GTS connection. And the reason we do that is because the GTS, the communication system itself, sometimes leaks data. Data get lost before it actually gets around the world. And so by having these different sites around the world to actually pull what they find on the GTS, we can determine if there's a dropout somewhere in the system. And in the early days, that was a problem. Uh, it's not so much a problem now. Every now and then, a a set of messages goes, Australia was telling us last week, they put data onto the, they gave the data up to their Bureau of Meteorology, they were told it went out to the GTS, it never got past Japan for some reason. Don't know, but anyway, it never got past Japan. If we had not had that tap from Japan, we would not have known about that. So this is a way for us in the program to make sure that the data are circulating on the GTS correctly. The near duplicates or inexact duplicates, as it says, two or more observations of the same data, 15 minute, five kilometers, but they aren't necessarily identical to each other. So the scheme we used 
was to adopt um, a checksum system that the telecommunications industry uses, in fact, to make sure that uh, audio voice, uh, voices going over communications lines are, are, are not garbled or other kinds of messages. And it's called this cyclic redundancy check. And it's, you don't really have to know the details, but essentially what it is is you input a data string to this check program and it outputs another 32-bit word, 32-bit character string. And that is uniquely determined by the content of the string that went in. And because it's 32 bits long, it's 2 to the 32 chances that the same two different strings will give the same result. So it's a pretty reliable way of getting a unique uh, identifier to attach to the data. And the, one of the main reasons we use this is because we wanted to be able to identify data we wanted the individuals who would use this identifier to be able to uh, generate an identifier based on the data that they were collecting and didn't have to be coordinated around the world. The only coordination needed was that we all used exactly the same algorithm. So that's what we uh, decided. It was decided in 2002 and it was implemented um, in the next couple of years. Um, I'll just skip through this. It's used primarily in the GTSPP is between the real-time data stream and what comes to the US NODC either through another avenue from their, their C's program uh, or delayed mode from that program. And the reason we do use it there is because the real-time message has no place to identify, to attach a unique identifier. So, in fact, we agreed upon what part of that message would actually be the input string to go to this identifier generation. And the U.S. does exactly the same thing. And so we shipped down to the U.S. the real-time data that's arrived in Canada with the identifier that we calculate based on what we receive. And they calculate the identifier at their end pass those data through emails or disks or whatever, another avenue into the NODC. And now the duplicate check is simply comparing if those two numbers are identical. So I'll show some examples. I don't want to go through too much of this uh, right now. It's, it's, uh, this is the C's operations. Essentially, they make observations at C, encode GTS message structures like TSACs or Bathy's onboard ship radio those ashore, goes out on the GTS. They also log the data on a, a computer disk, do the calculation on board as well, and that those disks are passed to NODC when the ship gets back to port or something like that. Things change a little bit. So we agreed on the scheme, and this kind of looks like the implementation. So the first one is the XPTs, largely it's used by XPT, the XPT program. It's collected at C. We, the record, uh, we build two, they build two records from the XPT data. The first one is they build, um, well, what they call a best message. Now, I guess that just, uh, um, I don't know what your best message is, Charles, at this point. This guy here. I don't know what constitutes best for you guys, but it doesn't hardly matter. Yeah, okay. So, so it splits it into two. There's the complete message that has all of the details that sees, captures, and so on. The next stage then is they build the real-time message at stage three here. They build the real-time message. So that's the bathy message. And send it out to the GTS. And they take that real-time message and they also use that to construct what they would get from the CRC calculation on the same component of the message that we will use later on. When the data come from the, into the GTS and come to us in Canada, we take the exact same piece of the message, run it through a CRC calculation, come up with a, a, a unique identifier, stuff it into the GTSPP format, and 
send it down to the US NODC. So they now have the data that come through this path and this path which has more details in it with a CRC value and they have the CRC that we calculated in Canada coming in this path and so then they do the comparison of those two numbers. So it doesn't look at date and time and identifier, none of that stuff is counts. It's simply the content, in fact it's the profile itself with the uh, depth, temperature, depth, temperature, depth, temperature. The, the entire profile is the character string that gets stuffed into this little algorithm. So they classify, US NODC classifies uh, how well they match and so if there is an exact match of the CRC value and the time and position. So this was a way to evaluate how well or what additional um, uh, value we were getting by going through this exercise of computing a unique identifier. So A just means that we found a duplicate by the old time and position match with the CRC, an exact thing. B is essentially the same, but it was the inexact match in time of position. C means we found a, a duplicate using the CRC calculation, the number, the unique identifier, but that was not detected by using the time of position checks of the old, the way we were doing it originally. Uh, some other things, um, sometimes you'll get um, well, they looked for, is there a match in the old time and position, but the CRC values are different. And either an exact or an inexact match in time. So are there instances where duplicates are leaking through and not being detected by the CRC? That's what D and E is about. And Z is just, there's a CRC present, but there is no data that come in uh, from Canada to match that. So if, essentially that's a profile that never got out to the GTS. So that's also something they wanted to see. So here's some statistics. It was done, um, so the data from 2004 to 2012, 76,000 stations. So you find that about 85% or 93% when you add these two together, the date time match is able to do exact matches at about 86 percent. An additional 8 percent get picked up by the inexact, the uh, inexact matches. Um, the other ones, C, D, and E, are all very small, which is what you would hope. But, and we're also able to see that about 6 percent of the data that's collected never go out to the GTS. Now in the C's program, I think the objective is to have 100% of the data go out to the GTS. Is that correct? Yeah, and if the system said because they play it out of the QC. Right. So they didn't put on GTS. Right. So it's a, this is just a, 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 a scheme that helps us kind of identify how well we're able to do to use that scheme. You can also use it in delayed mode. We've instituted it in Canada where we ask our uh, research institutes to do this calculation on CTD profiles send the data to us with the identifier because we found that sometimes you know somebody retires five years later a person finds these data and said gee I wonder if we sent it to, to Ottawa oh we'll send it anyway so they send it on again and without this unique identifier we have to fish around in our archives to try to figure out have we got it already with the identifier on it we can just do a straight simple match on this and it works right away. So that's uh, when buffer, which is a binary form of message types for the GTS, which is in the process of being implemented across the world, when that is actually running and all data are traveling in this uh, BUFR message structure, then we won't need to use this CRC anymore. There is a unique identifier that can be attached in the real-time message and in the delayed mode, and so we won't need to do it anymore. But converting all data to this message structure of buffer 
started about 10 or 15 years ago and we're not complete yet. So using the CRC will continue for some period of time. Okay, so that's that. That's the short version. Yes? I have a quick comment. On. We, we, we're going to have paper on the CRC and the, the document is available as a package in the training course. It's at the uh, references. And the file name is uh, IOC underscore NG and CRC in the final. Because this will be a, a complication as a best practice within IOD system. You can go to course training and open on reference. And the file name is uh, IOC. So yeah, it's an interesting exercise to, to read the paper and just see how it works. It's a uh, it's fairly it's a, a fairly robust system, and uh, um, we're still kind of testing it out. It's um, to see that we're that we're happy with how it works. So the next part I want to talk about is has to do with XPTs in particular. <coughs> and um, so it talks of the details of XPTs and what you need to know and some of the problems with those systems. And again, I'm just trying to compress this into uh, uh, a shorter time frame. So XPTs, expendable bathythermographs. Uh, you see this black tube is the clear tube that I showed you yesterday. Um, with the probe in the bottom here and the spools of wire. This is what it's called an auto launcher looks like. It's mounted on the rail of a ship, <coughs> excuse me, in a different uh, implementations. Uh, you can have four, six, eight tubes. You load them all up with XBTs and then you can drop them or trigger their drop from the bridge. So you don't have to go out individually and drop them like you did in the old days. And um, so it's just an easy way, and then the data are transmitted up to the data logger on the bridge. As I say, it measures the time of fall of the probe. It doesn't actually measure depth or pressure. It converts time of fall to depth through a, a calculation. <coughs> and this was a, a calibration done by the manufacturers. So, uh, XBTs are used in a lot of different places, in fact, and, and were a real workhorse for a number of years because they were easy to use. You could deploy them while the ship was moving, which with CTDs and other kinds of on oceanographic research vessels, you don't do. You stop, lower the CTD, collect the data, and move on. If you're with a, deploying these from a merchant ship on a, on a commercial line, for example, they want to get from port A to port B as quickly as they can and they have no time to stop so you just mount these sometimes there's a uh, one of the ship's crew is responsible for collecting the data uh, sometimes there's a, a rider a person who is sent on board that ship from the research institution <coughs> excuse me and they'll drop CTDs along uh, particular lines. And it, there it, it's used for looking at fronts and western boundary currents. You can compute uh, upper ocean heat content. Uh, some of the values go into numerical model calculations. Uh, lots, of different, uh, lots of different uses for XBTs. XBTs measure temperature to about a tenth of a degree. But still, that's good enough for some purposes. So here's... Uh, Let's see. This is, I guess, showing tra transport. Yes, transport calculations uh, in the Antarctic region from a line. Ah, oh, there's a line there. So it's from, uh, I guess, Cape Town down to the Ant the Antarctic here. And so the ship took uh, different routes, probably because at some times of year there's ice and uh, they can't always follow exactly the same path and this just shows uh, some of the transport calculations that you can get out of XPT data. <clears throat> Here's a, a schematic of where they try the SOUP, the Ship of Opportunity program of, of, uh, of JCOM tries to maintain uh, ships on these particular tracks, the ones that you see here. 
And they have, this shows, in fact, um, three different kinds that, uh, yeah, the frequent, frequently repeated, which they try to do monthly. The high density lines mean they want to drop an XBT, I think, every 25 kilometers. And some lines are supposed to be a high frequency and and are high density and frequently repeated. So for example, this line here, this IX1, it goes from Perth to Java, I guess, or whatever that island is. Sorry, I, my geography fails me. Anyway, that's done monthly, uh, typically done monthly. Um, and you can see some of these other lines. And many of these, some of these lines from the US to Hawaii, Hawaii down to uh, Numea, I guess, there. Um, some of those are run, <coughs> the Scripps Institute puts a, a person on board to actually run those XPTs. Uh, other lines are just done exclusively by the ship's crew. They volunteer to do this. And so this is, this is what they try to do. What they actually do is, do I have a picture of that? No. What they actually do is less than that because ships, you know, they, in the middle of a, a voyage across the ocean, the ship may be sold and the new owner wants to move it to carry some other uh, uh, cargo from a different port to a different port. So the ship may end up going to the port it was originally scheduled for, back up to a completely different port and sail a completely different line. So it's a it's a constant struggle, if you will, to maintain this series of lines using commercial vessels. <clears throat> There's no hope of maintaining it through research vessels. There just aren't enough vessels and money to support that. Nevertheless, there's a, a fair amount of data. I think in the course of a year, we get something on the order of 18,000 XBT drops, um, which is down from what it was originally, but in fact, that's okay because Argo now is picking up the sort of broad scale distribution which the XPT folks try to do <clears throat> and uh, because Argo can fill in though that broad scale sampling better than XPTs they reduce the number of XPTs they try to collect um, so that's what it looks like um, so the low density, that's no longer sampled. It used to be that was the broad scale global sampling that was, was discontinued when Argo became a serious program. So high density, one, one deployment every 25 to 50 kilometers. Usually on the shelf, they'll do it at uh, the, the higher resolution spacing. Um, four transects a year if they can do that. That's the uh, target. And they're frequently re repeated, uh, six to eight per day. 12 to 18 per year. So that, those, those are the objectives. So we'll look if I want to. I want to move on. Uh, yeah, we'll talk a bit about bias issues. So XBTs have been in operation since I guess it's around the late 60s. Something like that is when XBTs first started being used. And the manufacturers the original manufacturer was a company called Sipican, um, and uh, they were deployed and been used for many years with the equation that the manufacturer gave for converting the time of fall to the depth. And then in about the uh, mid-1990s, well, early 1990s, uh, some folks decided they would do test drops uh, they would lower, start lowering a CTD, and when it got to a certain depth, they would deploy an XBT at the same place, and then uh, bring those coincident data together and see how well the CTD temperature profile matched the XBT profile. <clears throat> and this was done with a variety of, of probe types and a variety of places in the in the ocean. So a number of countries contributed to this. Um, Sipican donated the probes to do this, cal this uh, comparison. And in fact, what they found was the probes fell at a slightly different rate than the manufacturer had um, said. <clears throat> and it was the order of a 3% difference in the depth. So if it's a 100 meter probe, like uh, T4s, I think, are 
the shallow water probes. I think that's right. And uh, so in 100 meters or 200 meters, 3% is doesn't really matter very much. But when you're deploying uh, T7s, which are typically 800 meters, and I think T6s are the deep ones at 1,200 meters, those it does make a difference there. And so there was a, a, a study led by a fellow in Japan, Hanawa, and they published a paper in 1995 that documented these, these uh, computational errors. And uh, so they essentially what happened is Hanawa and his colleagues developed a new set of fall rate equations where the coefficients were a little different. And those came into the literature and into the code tables that the WMO maintains for these, um, these probe types. And new data from that point forward were being collected with, with the new fall rate equations. But there was some transition time between using the old set of equations and the new set, new equations. And so in 1995, uh, IODE at one of its meetings said, to the, all the data centers present, make sure when you receive XBT data that you find out what probe type was used. And if it's older than 1995, then it would certainly be the old fall rate equation. If it's newer, ask them what fall rate equation they used. Because it makes a difference in when you're computing uh, climatologies and so on. And so there's this issue of a uh, the old equation, which is called the uncorrected depth, a new equation, which is the corrected depth. And there's ways within the, uh, within the GTSPP format to record which fall rate, which probe type there is, which fall rate equation. And the, uh, the, the uh, surface code, so in that surface codes group, this PFR dollar, so it's FR is the fall rate, and in there we record the value in the WMO code table that designates the probe type and the recorder type, and attached to that is the fall rate equation. So every XBT that we have in our archives now should have that information. And that's also encoded in the real-time messages as well. But there's the issue of what to do with the historical data in the archives. And in many cases, the type of probe that was used, certainly before 1995, uh, many cases the probe type is not uh, identified at all. <clears throat> so you don't, know, you don't know whether it's good or bad. Uh, you can use a deep probe in a shallow, uh, or sorry, you can, when you have uh, a shallow probe, so if you're, in a, say, doing a fisheries research and you're operating off the shelf, but you only have uh, shallow XBTs, you can still throw the shallow XBT over the side. It stops at 200 meters. It's impossible for the data center or some user to know whether that was a deep probe that, was, that failed at 200 meters but still has this problem of the fall rate or whether it's a shallow probe. Anyway. So there's been an elaborate uh, discussion of how to deal with that. And just to say that it's encoded within the, uh, the uh, GTSPP uh, record structure. And, and this is a good example of a problem that arose after we generated the GTSPP formats and had the system up and running. And suddenly, we needed to be able to record the probe type and fall, fall rate equations. And we had nothing, uh, nothing built in for that. We hadn't anticipated that problem. But because we built code, uh, code value, the actual value of the of what that code is, and then a quality flag, we just added another kind of code into the code table, and we're able to accommodate it within the format. So the uh, the XBT probe type is encoded into this WMO code table 1770, and and you can find all of these tables. Uh, on the WMO website. Um, I think it, there, yeah, that's the place to look. That's, and the uh, recorder type is in a code table 4770. And that 
that table shows you what the fall rate equations are. Um, so, some statistics from the U.S. So there's a million XBT profiles. Uh, so about 7% of the total archive of XBTs in 11 of March. And uh, tell me what these codes mean. Charles, 35% is DPC01. What does that mean? Okay, it's on another slide. Let's look at that. <clears throat> so 01 means the probe type is known and it's determined that it's the old fall rate equation was used. Uh, two is the probe type is known, but it was the new fall rate equation. Three is we have no idea what the probe type is, so we can't know what to do. And four means it's a known probe type and a correction was done. So it was an old fall rate equation, but because it was the probe type where we had a new equation, you could do that calculation. And uh, five is, <clears throat> don't know what the probe type is, but a correction was done based on some other knowledge. So let's look at this. So one, two, three. So these are ones where about 35% of the archive has probe types known, and it was the old fall rate equation. And two is, I think three is the new fall rate equation. So you can see a lot of the data that's, that exists in the archive now is with the new equation. Uh, but there's still 40 some odd percent in the archives that have the old fall rate. So another wrinkle to, to, to uh, worry about when you're archiving uh, XBT data in particular, and who knows for Argo floats if we'll need to do um, things uh, capture more metadata for them. There was an example within Argo of uh, <clears throat> one of the pressure sensors in one of the models of floats had a manufacturer's error, uh, a, a fault in the manufacturing process. And um, we needed to be able to identify which floats and which profiles were affected by this uh, pressure failure. And because at the beginning we decided We'll just keep everything we know about the instrument, the serial number, the manufacturer. We kept all of that information in uh, the metadata parts of the Argo records. So it was possible to go back and say, this float, this date, has, has this uh, pressure sensor that failed. Some of them were able to be corrected because we were able to identify them. If we hadn't kept that data, those profiles may well have gone away. So it just argues for uh, having, having ways to add, uh, make sure you uh, manage a lot of metadata rather than less and, uh, and uh, it helps you fix errors that turn up later. Um, some statistics you can look at this, I don't think. Uh, oh, yeah, these are these list of numbers here. Those are the identifier numbers in table 1770. So they don't mean anything to you right now. But essentially, this tells you what kind of probe it is and uh, what the fall rate equations are. Uh, <clears throat> and this suite of codes, they have correctable. So it was a T4, T6, or T7 where we know what a new fall rate equation is, so we can make corrections of that. Not all probe types were uh, uh, used in the comparison exercise. <clears throat> so Sipican was the original uh, uh, manufacturer of the, uh, of the uh, XBT, and then a company in Japan, TSK, uh, manufactures, has a manufacturing license for distribution in Japan for our XBT. So it's done to the specifications of Sipican but it's the, essentially the, the manufacturer that supplies the Japanese with the XBT probes they have. And UNK means unknown, unknown. So with some, there were other manufacturers in the earlier days, and uh, we don't know what they did. We didn't keep the inf information about the instrumentation detailed enough to know. 
And that's a lesson learned that, uh, in fact, we should have within the global data system somewhere um, keeping records of what the specifications are for the instrumentation that's used so that in 50 years' time, people won't scratch their head and say, well, what kind of a probe was this? Or what kind of an instrument was that? And how well could it measure things? So there's some references in the, uh, this is the, uh, talks about some of the uh, comparisons um, and a bibliography of the XBT quality test reference table. So that's, uh, that's the quick overview. Charles, there's an exercise here if you want to uh, work through that. <coughs> I think the XPT bias is a really important issue. Um, particularly when you try to calculate the heat content in the old days, you know, back to maybe 1990 or earlier. Um, there are a lot of papers published doing on the calculation of the XPT, or the calculation of the heat content. I, I keep my finger crossed. The author really pay attention to the XPT bias, okay, because the issue only addressed in the most recent years. So no, it's, it's still kind of ongoing issue. So far right now, the, there, there was a group called the uh, uh, IQUA, stands for I-Q-U-O-D, International Quality Con Controlled Ocean System Samsung, IQUA. Okay. Uh, if you try to come out with a kind of standard procedure for the quality count, for the, for the, for the correction on XBT depth issue. But this group never come to a kind of consensus. What is the best equation to, to do it for the correction? So, so I recall back to the worst time, we, we decide, particularly in the GTPP community, we decide to make a simple Close enough or accurate enough for the depth correction. That's for the P, uh, PFR, the, the, the factor, the 1.036. I don't know why CSIL comes with that kind of magic number, but that is, uh, that's the time we decide to times all the depths by that number. Okay, and the one reason for doing that the, is it reversible? You, you, you disagree that the GTPP did, you no. Know, you can just say divided by 1.3, 1 1.03 something, and it will back to the original value. So it's, a, it's an easy way to fix, but may not be the best way or agreed upon by all the community. So, so bear in mind, when you do the XBT work, make sure that you are using the correct or suggest uh, for equation to calculate the depths. And make sure that you provide the, all the detailed meta data information, you know, preserve the information either to GDPP or through other your national archive. And, uh, and the, that's very important that we can use that information for future use. Okay. But something we decide is correct today, maybe later on, you know, the next generation will say this is wrong. So preserve information is critically important. During the worst time, the GDPP spends a lot of personal time to look into individual file and identify the file type. We, you know, at the NLDC, spend a lot of human resource doing this. So a person retired, so we kind of lost person time to do this, so it's still hanging there. But we encourage people who need to submit the data, SBT, particular SBT data to, to the archive and, and provide detailed information as much as possible. Okay. So, in this exercise, we I can go back to my account. See, there should be a file there. Okay, I didn't make this bigger. It's good. Okay, and let me. Okay, there should be something called eleven. Oh, I have to make sure I try files there. Yeah. Okay. So according to my note, I believe I download another data set. This is a real-time data set. 
not real time, XBT. So the file name should be say something. Okay, how how we do this? Yeah. Okay, so I let make sure the file is is layer before I give the demo. Uh, one two zero one four. Where one something? Yeah. Okay. It's there. So so this is the file that I create. You know, before I came came down here, it's it's a real time, basic message. It's most likely. Uh, we hope there was some XPT information there, and it's a compressed file. You can see this is this is download. Uh, by using uh, GWI, the web interface. Now you can do the same thing, but limit the number to in the, within this year, within on this date, 01, 07, make it far smaller. So, so let's take a quick look on the, the, the R, R script looks like, how it looks like. No, not this one. Okay, G, it's called GTAPPP. Because the exercise is is uh, it's from previous file called readgtpp ASCII, and anyway to uh, modify the pro program to read compressed file, which is uh, ended with .gg. Okay, and I was telling you what's the U, what's the R code to read compressed file. Okay, so by using the definition for in earlier day, in earlier I, I told you the easy way to read file, you could just call file here. But since this is a compressed, it's totally it's a binary, you know. So so R has another way to read the compressed file. You no, know, without uncompressed and read. So you just read compressed file directly. You know, by use by doing that you have to say GG file. Okay, so that's the difference. And the following one, the following will be very lengthy, very long. You no, know, it's a kind of relatively long script to 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 unwind the uh, GTPP main ASCII file, and including the station record. You see that there's a station info. This is the subroutine to unwind the, the station record, and that's another one you can tell you can see called pro info here. Okay, so. So that this program allow you to read the compressed uh, meta ASCII file and the, and the read the, the station record section and the, the profile record section. Okay. Now, now the, to keep going. So there was such every single line and looking for service call group. That called a service call group. Okay. For all the service call content. The service code reverend uh, to the XBT. So you are looking for PEQ, you know, and, and as Bob said earlier, or RCT, all the possible because uh, within the GTAPP partner, some data center uses slightly different approach to record XBT information. So this is a little bit you know, chaotic within at least with among the data center. So so as the archive center, we, we have to figure out. What's the most likely this center will use? What's the most likely this center will use? So this come up with all the this is the, the routine right here. Okay, it will hopefully can cover everything okay. from different uh, data center. So so this loop looping through the service call group and find all the possible information about uh, the XBT. Okay, and this is the going to the, and the output and write up the output file. Okay, so, so I will give you a quick demo on how this pro, uh, program work. So as I said, we don't have to go to R. You can do the same thing, but right now we just run from the command line. So for doing that, you just say, I believe, you, you, okay, I, be, I, I can, we can do this, R, hmm, let me see. Okay, let me move to the next slide, maybe that's the answer to that, but no, okay. I believe I just said, let's try this way, maybe not. 
It's no. The problem is the mouth won't stay, and it's always kind of. <laughs> yeah, it's run away. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll take a look again on the file. One more, make sure. Okay, this is not read com the, the parameter from the commander, so I have to go to the uh, the R environment. Okay, because I, I didn't see there's an argument in the at the first night. Okay, so 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 I have to go to the R environment by typing R for the command line. So in this case, good. You, you can try on your PC. You now you open up, you bring out your R, click on icon, and bring out the R R window. Okay, and then you have to say. Just a type source, okay, and the, the, the program name, which is gtspp uh, ex11 1 dot r, single quote, okay, so so that will work out. So this will tell you which M key stands for uh, which, which record, and have all the information, as we can see. Let me move over here. Okay, so tell you the PFR down sign equal to what number it is. Most likely is that XBT and TPC equal to two and so forth. So you can you still see there are a lot of similar uh, uh, pro doesn't have the TPC down, which means we don't know what to do with that. We don't have enough information about doing that. Okay, so so this is just. A, and, and this is just a warning message. It doesn't mean anything. You can see the, at the end of the output is a warning. This is just a, a warning. It doesn't doesn't do, do anything harm, harmful at all. Okay. So so I gave you maybe five minutes to to test one on your window environment and see if it should work. 